The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Beloved, please turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And if you'll turn with me over to Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Here ends the reading of God's word. Would you pray with me? Our Father, I pray that we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ loves his church. He gave his life for his church. And so shouldn't we love the church too? Amen? Shouldn't we love the church too? With all of its warts, with all of its dissension, with the struggle that takes place within every church to remain unified, we still love the church. Christ loves the church, and he gave his life for her. I remember several years ago, I was visiting a congregation in the middle of farm country in South Carolina. Uh, truth be told, I do not remember where it is. Um, and I can't remember the name of the church, but it was this lovely little church out in a in farm country, uh, probably 50 or 60 members. And I began speaking with an elderly couple. Uh, they are probably in heaven now. Uh, this was many years ago. And I began asking them questions. So how long have you been uh, a member of the church? They both looked at me and said, our entire lives. They said, we were both baptized in this church. We were raised and catechized in this church. We, uh, this is a married couple, by the way, they said we uh, uh, made our profession of faith and came to the table uh, in this church. Uh, we fell in love in this church. Uh, we have grown in our walk with the Lord and matured in this church under the shepherding care of godly uh, ministers and elders. And we have our burial plot picked out right outside the church in that graveyard. And it was a beautiful picture of the Christian life. And the way God has designed the Christian life, growing up in a covenant home, being raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and instruction and catechesis and under faithful gospel preaching, uh, being baptized and being taught what that baptism means and then being 
upon profession of faith, brought uh, to the Lord's table, and uh, to have that union with Christ and communion with Christ by grace through faith, and then uh, to die in the Lord. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's not often how Christians view the Christian life, however. The church is meant to be at the very center of our piety as Christian believers. If it is not, then we are being unbiblical in our approach to uh, the Christian life. I think, too, of how important it is to have the intergenerational fellowship in the life of the church, to have children in our worship services, for a five-year-old to hear uh, an 85-year-old singing God's praise and, 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 and seeking to uh, to, to, to gain the breath to be able to sing that next verse, especially when there are eight verses of a long psalm, right? <laughs> I know some of you are thinking, are we really singing this entire psalm? <laughs> it's also important for the, for the 85-year-old to hear the 5-year-old singing and giving praise to God. I'll never forget a sweet moment very soon after, one of our dear members had lost his wife of over 60 years, and he just went to heaven a few weeks ago. But I remember, typically when we get to the fourth verse of a hymn, and that fourth verse was typically about heaven, he would be weeping over his hymnal, missing his precious wife, and singing through the tears. And, and then I, I also remember at those times during the greeting when uh, the children would come up and give him uh, a warm embrace before the service and to to watch all this we we have the most wonderful perspective as ministers when we're up front seeing all of this taking place in the life of the congregation this is the church the church that we are called to love but this has gone out of the minds of many christians today Uh, we have seen Uh, through the the pandemic and through lockdowns and through a a lack of teaching and through the big box churches and a lack of discipleship, uh, that people are going away from the church and they are not conceiving of the church as they are. They do not believe that the church has a central place in the Christian life. And so this morning what I want to do is contrast a bit with you a biblical view of Christianity, the life of the church, the means of grace, and what we now call what we have been calling evangelicalism. And I would add to that Christian progressivism, which we see uh, infiltrating the church in our own day. So I hope this will be helpful as we think through some of these things topically and as we connect uh, to Colossians 1 and Acts 2. J. Gresham Machen was one of the greatest defenders of biblical Christianity in the 20th century. He fought hard against Uh, the tide of theological liberalism that was overtaking Princeton Seminary and the Presbyterian Church U.S. He eventually left both uh, Princeton and and the PC uh, U.S. and uh, and was instrumental in establishing Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia and the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Both the seminary and denomination remain bastions of confessional faithfulness and biblical fidelity to this day. Machen wrote several books, his most popular, of course, published in 1923, entitled Christianity and Liberalism. The book was written not only to highlight the vast differences between historical, biblical Christianity and the liberal version that characterized many of the mainline denominations of his day. It was also written to make the point that Christianity and theological liberalism in the mainline church were so radically different in their view of Scripture God, Christ, sin, salvation, judgment, and a whole host of other doctrines that they actually constituted two different religions altogether. In other words, the liberal Christian church that rejects the fundamental doctrines of the historic Christian faith is not really Christian at all. It's of another spirit. It's a different religion altogether. Machen expressed it this way in 1923, quote, The chief modern rival of Christianity is liberalism. An examination of the teachings of liberalism in comparison with those of Christianity will show that at every point the two movements are in direct opposition. Elsewhere he wrote, 
It is no wonder then that liberalism is totally different from Christianity, for the foundation is different. Christianity is founded upon the Bible. It's, ba it's, it's based upon the Bible, both its, uh, it bases upon the Bible both its thinking and its life. Liberalism, on the other hand, is founded upon the shifting emotions of sinful men, end quote. Of course, these days, it's much easier to recognize the differences between historical biblical Christianity and the mainline liberal denomina denominations, not least because of the widespread propagation of heresies and uh, like universalism and, and gay marriage and, and the utter rejection of the inerrancy and authority of Scripture. What may not be so obvious, however, are the differences between historic biblical Christianity and modern-day evangelicalism. Modern-day evangelicalism, which, by the way, denominations like the PCA and the OPC and the ARP and other denominations that are uh, Nate Park denominations had so much uh, in common with evangelicalism prior to the last 20 years. There would have always been things we departed with them on, but there was a, a commonality. There were common places we could touch, and yet we see that disappearing at a great pace. If Machen were living today, I believe he would write a book called Christianity and Evangelicalism, or Christianity and Progressive Christianity. It doesn't have a very good ring to it, but... But he, he would be showing the contrast between true biblical Christianity and what we now call modern evangelicalism or progressive Christianity. And he would show how they also, in many respects, constitute two different religions. Some here this morning might be wondering what evangelicalism even is. It's not a denomination. It's not a church. It has no bishop or pope and no common creed or Confession. Well, Joel Osteen may be the bishop of evangelicalism. I don't know. I don't know if you, I was sharing with someone yesterday that there was a tweet that went out where Osteen was being attacked for being a Calvinist. It was this strange intersection of misunderstanding and strange worlds colliding. Osteen had some, said something about God ordaining something in his life. And this person immediately thought, this guy's a Calvinist. I'm going after him. Shows the confusion of our day, doesn't it? So what is evangelicalism? Well, that's a question many theologians and historians have been grappling with over the last 30 years. One writer aptly calls it, quote, an unstable constellation of personalities and organizations. I would define evangelicalism this way. A broad movement constituting, constituted of professing Christians, leaders, and organizations that focus mainly on conversion and cultural transformation. A broad movement constituted of professing Christians, leaders, and organizations that focus mainly on conversion and cultural transformation. Though rooted in centuries past, the evangelical movement in America began to come into its own between the 1920s and 1950s. During these decades, born-again Christians began to lose confidence, rightly so, in their mainline churches. Why? Because influential seminaries like Princeton and Columbia and churches associated with mainline denominations rejected the inspiration and authority of Scripture. The missionary arms of these denominations were almost exclusively focused upon social justice issues, social gospel endeavors. Word and deed ministry became deed and word ministry that became deed ministry. That was the mission of the church, deed ministry. Candidates for the ministry were being ordained even though they unashamedly denied essential Christian doctrines like the virgin birth and the resurrection of Christ and the miracles of Jesus. And so in response to mainline liberalism, many strong evangelical leaders began to emerge and parachurch organizations began to form. Parachurch ministries such as the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Fuller Seminary, Campus Crusade for Christ, Christianity Today, and the National Association of Evangelicals, but to name a few. New churches and denominations were also formed, though the real muscle of evangelicalism was found mainly outside the church. One historian wrote, Daryl Hart wrote, quote, in effect, 
The evangelical movement of the late 20th century replaced the church with the parachurch, and it developed forms to match. It developed forms to match. These parachurch organizations focused on crisis conversions, apologetics, conservative politics, and cultural transformation. Not, not lifetime spiritual nurture and discipleship through the ordinary means of grace in the life of the local church. Spiritual authenticity for many evangelicals then was no longer chiefly found in churchly categories like baptism, Lord's Day piety, communion, faithful church membership, a godly marriage, and an honest vocation. Anybody can be religious on Sunday, many thought. No, you showed your true zeal for Christ in other ways. At evangelistic crusades, promise keeper events, women's conferences, youth retreats, contemporary Christian music concerts, fellowship of Christian athletes, community Bible studies, and myriad other events. By the way, many of these things are wonderful and encourage godliness and various aspects of the Christian life. But I'm trying to make the point that these things have, in many minds, displaced the church and its importance. Authentic Christianity was found outside the walls of the local church through personal religious experiences, not through the ordinary ministry, discipleship, community, and shepherding care of the church. In the 80s and 90s, the evangelical movement became increasingly consumeristic with a perfect storm of the boom of the contemporary Christian music industry, the explosion of Christian publishing, the religious right, and the emergence of the seeker-friendly, non-denominational, megachurch, big-box church movement. The seeker-friendly church growth movement prided itself on doing whatever it takes to get unbelievers through the doors. Rock music, jazz music, stage lighting, practical how-to messages, great coffee and bagels. I'm not opposed to great coffee, by the way. <laughs> and all manner of programs for every demographic possible. It was a kind of informal weekly crusade meeting with professional music and entertaining speakers. Seeker-friendly, doctrinally min minimalistic churches like Bill Hybels' Willow Creek in Chicago and Rick Warren's Saddleback had a massive influence in America with thousands of pastors and churches emulating their pragmatic philosophy of ministry. And make no mistake about it, this is the foundation that was built upon which progressive Christianity now is being formed. And I do, bel do believe with Harry Reader that progressive Christianity is cut from the same bolt of cl cloth as liberal Christianity. It is of the same ilk. It's, it's a cousin of liberal Christianity. The next generation of seeker-friendly evangelical churches that we have in our own day are edgier, worldlier, and even more untethered to the historic Christian faith and worship. Beloved, the irony is that many mainline liberal churches retain more scripture, reverent congregational singing, and prayer in their services than do many evangelical churches, than do many churches even in our own ranks, in Napark churches. How can it be that you can walk into a staunchly liberal congregation that, that forsakes uh, uh, the teaching of the apostles, and yet their liturgies and their prayers and their commitment to reading scripture outdoes our own, even when they don't believe it? Let me give you a few examples of how far out and non-Christian, as it were, the evangelical church has become. It's become commonplace now for evangelical churches to play secular music at the beginning of their services. New Spring, with over 60,000 members statewide, do you think they're having an impact? Over 60,000 members has played everything from Beyonce. You probably don't, don't even know who that is. That's good if you don't. <laughs> to ACDC. I know a lot of you guys know about that. <laughs> to country music, Todd Pruitt especially. You know. To country music songs about pickup trucks, women, and beer in their morning services. And a couple of years ago when Prince died, 
Buckhead Church in Atlanta opened their service with Purple Rain. I could go on. Secondly, it's become commonplace for hip and edgy pastors to use foul language, salty language in their preaching. For this reason, in many churches, children under 12 are asked not to come into the service because they may be hearing things they shouldn't hear. Thirdly, the sermons in these churches are less like sermons and more like late night talk show routines. These messages are often superficial and do little to shape the, the mind in Christian doctrine. The evangelical movement is considered by most scholars and historians as anti-intellectual. In his epic book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, Mark Knoll writes, quote, The scandal of the evangelical mind is that there is not much of an evangelical mind. It is the pastor's personality that comes through during the sermons, not the word of Christ. Mike Horton comments that, quote, instead of ambassadors, heralds, reporters, and witnesses, pastors have become entrepreneurs, managers, coaches, therapists, marketing gurus, and communication specialists, end quote. So, dear ones, biblical and authentic Christianity describes pastors as shepherds, not showmen, servants, not celebrities, humble stewards in Christ's kingdom, and not builders of their own kingdoms. Fourthly, the mission of the evangelical church in general is far more focused on social action and cultural transformation, social justice, which is informed by CRT. More committed to these things than the proclamation of the gospel and ongoing Christian discipleship through church planting and the means of grace. A couple of years ago, I saw that Louis Giglio in Atlanta told over 40,000 impressionable young evangelicals that God told him the main mission of the church now, the main mission of the church now is the eradication of the sex trade. There are many other evangelical leaders who are saying similar things about their own version of the social gospel, what it is the church is called to do. Progressive Christianity is on the rise, and it's hitting close to home for many of us. As side B, gay revoice doctrine and social justice ideology make inroads into our churches. Responsibilities connected to pastoral oversight and shepherding care of the flock are outright rejected by ministers. Several years ago, a church in Southern California that my brother was attending at the time, this is prior to him being uh, reformed and confessional, the pastors told him in a, in a church membership class that they should never expect to receive a visit at the hospital or to get a call when there's a baby born because they are there to reach the lost of Southern California. Don't expect us to shepherd you. Go somewhere else if you want that. Evangelical churches these days do not know their pastor and have no elders providing them with spiritual oversight. It's rare these days to meet someone who comes into our church in Charleston that they actually knew the pastor in their former church or had any elder care. The state of the church in America right now proves that the liberal church is dying and the evangelical experiment in America is in its twilight. And the evangelical church's effort to be relevant and contextualized to the world, in part by downplaying doctrine and downplaying God's holiness and making Christianity highly subjective and personal rather than objective and biblical, both liberalism and evangelicalism have become exceedingly irrelevant in our culture today. The culture will shrug its shoulder, shoulders at a church that believes the same things that they do and has no word of hope for them. Liberalism is more easily identifiable as departing from the historic Christian faith because it outright denies essential truths. Modern evangelicalism and Christian progressivism, however, do not deny these essential truths by, profes by profession but by practice. Functionally, liberalism and many shades of modern evangelicalism and the progressive Christian movement are very different than authentic Christianity. Mike Horton, in his book, Christless Christianity, which I would encourage you to read, says this, quote, 
Liberalism started off by downplaying doctrine in favor of moralism and inter inner experience, losing Christianity by degrees. Nevertheless, it is not heresy as much as silliness that is killing us softly. God is not denied, but trivialized. End quote. Beloved, please hear this. Both liberalism and much of evangelicalism has hitched their wagons to the spirit of the age. They have hitched their wagons to the spirit of the age, and while retaining vestiges of biblical Christianity, they don't look a whole lot like the real thing. Evangelicalism places style over substance, felt needs over true needs, spiritual fads over roots and spiritual heritage, social justice and cultural transformation over gospel proclamation, personal experience over churchly piety. And by the way, as was expressed yesterday, I fully believe and affirm experiential Calvinism. But it takes place in the life of the church. Today's evangelicalism is severed from most traditional forms of Christian devotion. Statistics tell us that the sons and daughters of evangelicals are leaving the church in droves or becoming full-blown theological liberals or the so-called nuns holding to no religion at all. Why is this? It's not complicated. They've not been discipled in the faith. You know, when I came to know Christ, not too far from here, 31 years ago, I was in a terrible junk driving car accident. I was driving. A girl was thrown from the car. She went to the hospital, didn't know if she was dying or, or dead. I went to jail, and, and I was there. Just, just told I would probably spend the next 20 years of my life in prison. I was told this by uh, the officer. And while I was at this very, very low point, God, by his grace, came to this poor, wretched sinner and gave me a new heart and gave me new eyes and unplugged my ears and gave me new affections, explosive new affections in the Christian life. And, and, and the Lord saved me. But here's the thing. People ask, you know, John, who led you to Christ? Well, there was one guy in the cell with me, and he was laying in his vomit. So it wasn't him. What I like to share is, my pastors growing up led me to Christ. My mom and dad led me to Christ as they taught me Luther's shorter catechism. The Holy Spirit led me to Christ. When he turned the light on that wasn't on, but all the furniture was in the room. All the catechetical furniture was in the room. All the truth. All, all the thousands of times I, I repeated the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or the Athanasian Creed. I grew up in a Lutheran church. We, we did that, the Athanasian Creed. So clunky to recite in public worship. But we did it. And, and I heard the gospel over and over and over again as I was growing up. So, so in that moment when I'm at the, at the lowest of the low and, and I have, I have, I'm so low, the only place I can look is up by God's grace. God applied to me all those truths which I believed in my head, but certainly I did not believe in my heart. And gave, God gave me a new heart to believe. But see, children are growing up in the church these days and they don't have that. They're not hearing serious preaching. They're not, they're not being catechized. They don't know the, the categories of the Christian life. In the, the past few weeks, I've been walking uh, in our adult Sunday school class through uh, the larger catechism. We've been doing this actually for many months. And we've been looking these last few weeks at the categories of the humiliation and exaltation of Christ and how the Westminster Divines unpack those two truths and, and, and how important this is for the discipleship of the church. But people aren't learning these things anymore. Daryl Hart once again writes, the incongruity between a timeless message and a perpetually novel cultural idiom is difficult to harmonize. And we see this today with the moral revolution, the sexual revolution, the, uh, the social justice revolution. Trying to smash these ideologies into the doctrine of the church does not work. We cannot do this. 
Just a couple of weeks ago, I saw that one of our own ministers in our denomination is wearing a 1619 t-shirt as he's preaching in his church. Another church with a Black Lives Matter poster in the back of the church. These things are happening and people are trying to, to, to somehow bring these ideologies into the church because they believe it's helpful, helpful for our mission to have the ear of the culture. Where, as I said yesterday, do we see the apostles doing this? Well, they don't. They believe in the efficacy and the sufficiency of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. Paul didn't come into Ephesus and say, let's see how we can kind of combine the ideologies of of the idol makers over here in the town square so we can have a better ear to reach them. No, he called out their idolatry. He said, repent. And he believed that the Spirit of God through the preaching of the gospel is drawing the elect to himself. Why take time to consider theological liberalism and evangelicalism and Christian progressivism as we consider the importance of the church? Well, it's to foster in us a greater discernment for what is truly and authentically biblical Christianity. You know, Carl Truman will be with us tomorrow, and he wrote an article many years ago which really impacted me. Um, And what the point he was making is the Reformed faith Out of so many of the expressions of Christianity we see in the world, the Reformed faith has the metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, to survive the onslaught of cultural pressure and persecution. You can say amen after that. It has the metal because the greatest expression of biblical Christianity in the world today, namely Reformed and confessional Presbyterianism, believes that the Bible is sufficient for mission and ministry, that we don't need to accommodate the culture and and adopt the language and ideologies of the world in order to carry out our mission. Those iterations of the Reformed faith that begin to believe that we need to do that are wandering away from biblical Christianity and a proper expression of the Reformed faith. We need to remember these things. It's so important, especially young ministers and seminary students. It's so important because there are these seductive voices that are always calling out to say, you know, I know, I know you've been hearing a lot of things about the power of the means of grace and, and the importance and centrality of the church and the life of the church and ministry, but, you know, this looks so much better. It looks so much glossier and, 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 and more attractive. I'm going to embrace that. Here we need to be reminded not to give in to those siren voices that call us away from the glorious foolishness of the means of grace. What God says he will bless. What God has attached his promises to. The call here is to be courageous. To conform to scripture as it concerns serious lifelong discipleship. And the preaching and teaching of sound doctrine, the administration of the sacraments, reverent word-regulated worship, earnest prayer, sacramental piety, biblical mission, these things are found in the church. Churchless Christianity is not true Christianity. Acts 2.42, look there with me. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Much had taken place in the book of Acts, of course, prior to this passage. Luke introduced the book by greeting his primary readership, namely, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus was probably a Roman official of some kind who was either already a believer or was a a serious inquirer into the gospel and the happenings of the early church. Luke wrote the gospel uh, of Luke and the book of Acts as a kind of two-volume set, historically accurate, based on the facts. And he wrote this two-volume set, according to Luke 1.4, so that Theophilus and all those who would read or hear it may gain assurance concerning the person and redemptive work of Jesus Christ and the inception of the church. Luke begins the book of Acts by recording the final words of Jesus prior to his ascension. He said to his followers in chapter 1, verse 8, 
It is not for you to know times or season that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We learn in the following 27 chapters that this gospel witness is rooted and grounded in the establishment of God-centered, worshiping churches. Say that again. In the book of Acts, we see that this gospel witness, spoken of in Acts 1-8, is rooted and grounded in the establishment and strengthening of God-centered, worshiping churches. In the second uh, chapter, Luke records the events surrounding Pentecost, that point in redemptive history where the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit to uh, be poured out upon the church. And after this mis mysterious filling, Peter then preaches his courageous Pentecost sermon, calling the Jews to repentance, saying in chapter 2 and verse 36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Where is there preaching like that today? Repent and believe the gospel. At the end of this section, Luke records that about 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. So what did these 3,000 souls do after they were gloriously born again and added to the church? The first thing we are told is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Now, it's true that not everything that transpired within the pages of the book of Acts is meant to be normative for the church throughout the ages. No, it's, it's misguided to think that we uh, should be sort of recreating Pentecost or looking for Pentecost over and over and over again in our, in our services. Some of these events in Acts are unrepeatable events. However, as we survey all of Scripture and study our Bibles with care, we find that many things in Acts are normative for the church. And here we have one such powerful example in the gathering together of Christ's redeemed people to worship in the context of the church. We see that they have gathered to hear his word proclaimed, gather in fellowship, come to the Lord's table, and call upon God in prayer. And notice with me the first four words of these texts, and they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. Another translation puts it this way. They continued steadfastly. According to one commentator, the Greek verb, which is here translated devoted, quote, connotes a steadfast, single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. It is also interesting to note that Luke employs this verb again in chapter 6 as he communicates the apostles' resolve to keep prayer and the ministry of the word central in the ministry of the church. Is the church important for the Christian life? It is essential to the Christian life. It is assumed in the New Testament that if you are a Christian, that you will be a member of Christ's church, active, participating, exercising your gifts, Loving those around you, being a witness as a church to the world of the work of Christ. Luke begins in this Acts 2.42, this verse that describes the worship of the church. He begins with the doctrine which Calvin called the soul of the church. The soul of the church, the apostles' teaching. The doctrine or teaching or preaching of the apostles referred to the bold Declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, one can only imagine how energized these 3,000 new believers must have been to gather for worship and sit under the explanation and application of God's word by those who were commissioned to do so by Jesus Christ himself. And so this preaching was authoritative. The apostles walked with Christ during his earthly ministry. They were eyewitnesses of his amazing miracles and his resurrection. They were commissioned by Christ himself to deliver the word of God to the world. You know, some may ask, they say, 
Well, how, well, it was asked during the days of the Reformation, wasn't it? In the 1530s. The, the question was being asked, if the Roman Catholic Church is not the true church, and, and Christ, uh, his body and blood are not on the table, and, and the priests aren't sort of representing him in their priestly way, as the Roman Catholic Church would teach, then, then how is Christ, who is up there at the right hand of the Father, ministering to us while we are down here? And Martin Bucer, in 1538, sought to answer that question in his Concerning the Care of Souls, the first pastoral theology written for the Protestant Church, and to say that Christ, as prophet, priest, and king, continues to exercise those three offices through the ministry of the church, through the preaching of the word of God, through the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, and through prayer and the shepherding of the church. And so Christ himself, has ordained and blessed and organized the church that he would minister within the context of the local church through the means that he himself has ordained and promised to use in the lives of his children. This is why the apostles preached with such boldness and authority. They were not preaching their own ideas. They were preaching the very word of God. Like the angels, they were messengers of the truth that had been delivered to them by God himself so that it would be written down and then later proclaimed uh, to the world by ministers of the gospel. The apostles' doctrine was vested with the authority of Almighty God. Believing this did not make for light-hearted, casual, chatty preaching. On the contrary, it cultivated the kind of humble boldness that we see time and time again in the apostolic ministry and throughout church history and so beautifully highlighted in the days of the Protestant Reformation. The apostles' teaching and preaching was authoritative. Secondly, it was paramount. Their preaching was paramount. This is the reason why the apostles' doctrine is listed first by Luke. It's precisely because of faithful preaching. It's precisely because faithful preaching is of supreme importance in Christian worship. And it should be of supreme importance in every single church. We shouldn't set it aside for other things in our services, particularly music. Music has overwhelmed the modern church, whether it's contemporary music or even traditional music. We need to be careful not to displace the preaching. One large church instructs its pastors, quote, to limit their preaching to roughly 20 minutes because boomers don't have much time to spare. And don't forget to keep your messages light and informal liberally sprinkling them with humor and personal anecdotes. Well, there's power preaching. <laughs> that is the, that's the teaching that so many have grown up under over the last 30 years when it comes to preaching. But this growing 21st century attitude towards preaching is not what we see in the Bible. And here in Acts 2.42, the church was steadfastly devoted to the apostolic preaching. And the apostles themselves in Acts 6 made it clear that the ministry of the word was to remain paramount in the life of the church. Why? Because they understood rightly that the faithful preaching of God's word is no less than God communicating Christ to the elect. The preaching of the word of God both creates the church and nourishes the church because in the hands of the Holy Spirit, it is used to raise the spiritual dead to life in Christ. The preaching of the word of God raises the spiritually dead to life in Christ and nourishes and strengthens that person in Christ, in union with Christ. Perhaps this is why the great 20th century London preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones boldly asserted that the primary task of the church and of the Christian minister is the preaching of the word of God. In addition to being authoritative and paramount, it is effectual. The apostles' doctrine is effectual and that it accomplishes God's ordained intended purpose. What is that purpose? Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 89. The Spirit of God makes the reading, but especially the preaching of the Word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. Oh, what a comfort it is. We don't talk about this as much here, perhaps, as they do in the Dutch churches that have the so-called Book of Comfort, the Heidelberg Catechism, such a pastoral, wonderful pastoral confessional document. But what a comfort it is 
when the minister stands up and proclaims God's gospel promises to a people who are often heavily burdened and oftentimes suffering, what a comfort it is, what a dereliction it is for pastors to not preach the whole counsel of God to those who are suffering under great pressures and anxieties in the world. What freedom and joy it brings to hear the gospel faithfully preached, to know that this world is not our home, that we're always heading as pilgrims to a better country, as we heard yesterday. It's efficacious. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that for which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.21, it pleased God by the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. This, dear ones, does it, does it ever get old? Do we ever need to stop being reminded of how important the church is and how important the preaching of the word of God is in the context of the local church. The very place where disciples are made, from the cradle to the grave, or those who are brought in from the outside. It is the preaching, when it gets compromised, and weakened, and effeminate, and worldly, and full of sociology, and psychology, and all the other ologies, rather than theology, when that happens, that's where you see the incremental weakening of the Christian church. Whether it's a congregation, a presbytery, or a denomination. When the preaching of the word is compromised, when the, God's people are not devoted to the apostles' teaching, as set forth in the word of God, and as clearly communicated in our Reformed confessions, we begin the slide into eventual liberalism into eventual liberalism and our preaching. And I want to close with some few comments about the means of grace and the wisdom of God. God, if I, if, if I can say this, it sounds silly, but the genius of God, the genius of Christ in establishing his church in the way that he has with the ordinary, unimpressive, unadorned means of preaching water, bread, and wine. So that when he uses these things, as he has promised to do in the lives of his elect all around the world, whether it's in the Andes Mountains or in Australia or in, in Greenville, South Carolina, wherever it may be, that when he uses these means, he gets the glory. Because when we are so hard at work at making the church impressive, what happens is the means of grace get sidelined and Christ gets minimized. But God, in his wisdom, has given us the preaching of the word and he has made the ear, the organ of faith, so that the church is it what's constantly being reinforced when this gospel is preached from all of scripture is we are reminded that we are not saved by works. The feet, the feet aren't aren't the organ of faith, as in you do things in order to be saved. You are saved because of what Christ has done, and you are supposed to hear about that every Lord's Day. This is what Christ has done for you. This is your salvation. It has been accomplished in Christ. And you're hearing that Lord's Day after Lord's Day in the faithful preaching of the word of God. Hence, you are made mature disciples through this preaching of the gospel and through the preaching of the law as a guide for the Christian life and how we are to live as God's people. And then we come to the table and the Lord's Supper is, well, let's go to baptism first. We're reminded of our baptisms and what Christ has done for us and the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit and the, the, the blood of Christ washing away our sins. And we come to the table and we are reminded that it is Christ who has saved us. And so these means of grace are constantly glorying in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. The evangelical church and the Christian progressive church is sidelining these things and making cultural ideologies the center of the life of the church. And so who gets displaced? 
God gets displaced. Christ gets displaced. And man, therefore, becomes the center of it all again. Listen to what Lloyd-Jones says. The Lord Jesus Christ was the theme of the preaching of the early church. As you read the book of Acts, you will find that our Lord's disciples always preached Jesus and the resurrection. They went to people and told them about this person. This was the whole of their teaching. You never find them starting with the political or social situations. They said, quote, listen, we have something to tell you about a person whose name is Jesus. In two summary statements describing his preaching, Paul told the Corinthian church, I preach and know nothing but Christ and him crucified. In Galatians 3.1, he described his preaching as a vivid portrayal of Christ crucified, so detailed and accurate that it was as if those who heard him were ac actually there on Golgotha's hill watching him bleed and die for them. Listen to uh, 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 Calvin's commentary on this text in Galatians. Remember, the Galatians weren't there watching Jesus die. Paul says, you have forsaken the one whom you have seen crucified. But listen to what, what Calvin says. Quote, let those who would discharge aright the ministry of the gospel learn not merely to speak and declaim, but to penetrate into the consciences of men to make them see Christ crucified and feel the shedding of his own blood. Preach Christ, brothers. Preach Christ and him crucified. Let us pray the prayer of Simeon. Lord, Charles Simeon, Lord, may I feel deeply that which I preach. And may our people, may the congregation feel deeply that which is being preached. So our Christianity isn't formalized, but it is experiential and true and real and vital. That's the Christianity we have to experience ourselves and to offer to the world. And so we see the importance of the church. Everywhere in Scripture, it is assumed that if you confess to know Christ, that you are an active member of the body of Christ. Paul it says in Colossians 1, 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. To make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this majesty, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone. Part of preaching, faithful preaching, is warning, admonishing. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. This gets at the very heart of the importance of the church. Yes, it's Christ's bride. It's his temple, as it were. It's his body. We have all these wonderful metaphors in Scripture. But let us not forget that this is where disciples are made. This is where Christians are matured. And that is to be the end and aim of every true Christian church. Ah, oh, but pastor, we need these big box churches in order to reach people for Christ. And then they come to us to get catechized and to learn some things. That is a nonsense. Every church isn't meant to look exactly the same in the way they do all their different things. But the point is this. Every church should be a mature disciple-making church. And that's why the church is so important. And Paul says, for this I toil, that I may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works in me. We see that the early Christians were committed to fellowship. They were committed to the breaking of bread. They were devoted 
steadfastly devoted to the prayers. What we see here, beloved, is the centrality and the importance of the local church for the Christian believers. This, this should be instinctive in a way. It should be the impulse of our hearts if we are filled with God's spirit who wants us to be with other believers. You, you may have been hurt in a former church. You may have experienced uh, terrible leadership in a church that you've been in formerly. But let me encourage you. Don't give up on what Christ has said he's going to use in your life to mature you and bless you. Find a solid, healthy church. You say, well, pastor, there's not one within 100 miles of me. Move. <laughs> find a new job. Take a pay cut and move and find a new job. And I'm not saying this flippantly. I know these things are very challenging. But we need to recognize the importance in centrality or, or, or help plant a church in your area. Don't just throw your hands in the air and say, well, there's just no church nearby. I'm not going to go to one. I'm going to do live stream church the rest of my life. That never replaces the gathered church. Don't do metaverse church. That never replaces the church as Christ himself has instituted it and designed it. He wants us to be together. He wants us to weep together, to rejoice together, to come to the table together, to remember our baptisms together, to hold one another accountable, to love each other all the way to the finish line. Amen? All the way to the finish line. And what a joy to be a member of Christ's church. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this brief time considering the great contrast we see between true biblical churchly Christianity and that which is undermining it seemingly at every point of our culture. We pray, O oh God, for your grace that you give us discernment that you would grant us deep conviction, that you would fill us with your spirit, you'd help us to go forward with boldness and courage and humility and love and compassion, that our hearts would love that which you love, Father, that we would love that which you died for, Lord Jesus, that we would love that which you have been poured upon, Holy Spirit, that we would love the church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.